this is my great honor and pleasure to open today's webinar and also chair this webinar. Uh, this is a special session because first of all, we have uh, a great guest, great speaker, Professor Kordula Świętorzecka with us. Uh, yes, welcome. Uh, but we have also something uh, not that special, but also special. I mean, uh, additional talk, which will be provided by um, two young researchers uh, who won uh, the Gettles Prize 2021, namely <clears throat> Mr. Michał Pawłowski and Mr. Bartosz Wesu. Uh, and of course, uh, afterwards, we will have a discussion. So we'll try to somehow refer to both topics. Um, the first topic, which will be presented by Professor Krudula Świętorzecka, uh, uh, is devoted to, uh, to two, uh, well, different, but maybe similar uh, proofs or arguments for God existence provided by Ibn Sina and um, Bolzano. Uh, and first of all, let, let me let me introduce our, our speaker. Uh, Professor Cordula Świętorzecka is a very famous logician from Warsaw. Uh, she's a head of uh, uh, the Department of Logic at the Institute of Philosophy of the Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University of Warsaw. Um, her interests are generally broad, but also related to uh, what we are dealing with uh, here uh, on our webinars. Uh, the first field or scope of her research is formalization of uh, various concepts of change. This is one, one thing, as something prior to, um, to time. So she used this uh, model logic of cha change and its extensions. Uh, another thing is formalization or applying model logic to uh, formalizing some fragments of such philosophers as Aristotle, Leibniz, or Bolzano, and also formalization of the arguments of, so what, what we will deal today with, uh, arguments for God's existence, uh, also presented by Aquinas, Leibniz, Bolzano. Uh, and finally, um, her scope of interest uh, is also um, the Krakow Circle and its philosophical achievements uh, and their reconstructions because uh, so, uh, Father Salamucha, Father Bochański, and Sobodnowski and Sobocinski yeah, are, are the people who, who tried to deal with theology and uh, formalization of theology uh, and um, Professor Kordula Świętorzecka uh, tried also to, to assess uh, their, their results. Um, finally, she's, a, uh, she's a, the author and co-author of many, many uh, important publications, uh, including 10 books, <laughs> yeah, and uh, more than 40, like 47 scientific articles. Uh, I, I think that to many, many of you, uh, Professor Kordula Świętorzecka is no, uh, but uh, for others, uh, we wanted also to, to introduce her. Um, and and I, I'm sure that many of you will be interested in what she's publishing. Uh, so, Sorry. Professor Shintorzecka, yeah, yeah. the floor is yours. We are very- the relationship uh, between logic and um, religion. Uh, oh, right. well, yeah. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, maybe there Hello? is a problem with microphone. Okay, now it's okay. Hello, can you hear me? Now, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, great introduction. <laughs> uh, actually, I would like, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear my voice double time. Uh, what to do? Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Professor. I will try to continue even I can hear double time my voice. Oh, maybe so maybe it's, maybe it's because you went through with two users. And so um, we have okay. another what user. What should I do? Oh, um, we have another user called Cordula here, which is, uh, I guess it's uh, you as well. And yes. it, it's not, it's not, 
it is unmuted and you uh the other user is muted i so, see i okay. see what should i do in this situation you you just have to um perhaps leave the the okay the, talk. the other the, user will... can leave the talk and then okay. you can remain with your user You just have now to... How it is now? Oh, now it's... Okay, oh. now I am in one person better. because before I was in two persons. Thanks God, yeah. not in three. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's a very, a very big pleasure. Thank you very much, Martin, for inviting me uh, to take part in this webinar. Uh, in fact, uh, the material which I prepared for today is a kind of premiere. I haven't uh, shown it uh, publicly before. So I am sorry, maybe uh, during these presentations, I will be not very fluent, but I will try to do my best. And now I would like at first to share my uh, screen. May I? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. And now I have here. Can you see my screen? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Uh, super. And now I would like to, just a second, I want to share. Okay, and uh, okay. Do you Maybe see my slides? Do you, do you see no, my slides? Uh, Hello? Uh, the first screen uh, seems to be small. May you increase? Because uh, I will try. How it is now? Is it better? No, it's, no, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, sorry, I will jump between two documents. One, there are the slides, and the second one is a text with a source. Uh, uh, I mean, with the material which I considered to formalize. Uh, it means especially the text of Avicenna. Uh, so I will start with my small introduction. The story is the following. In 2014, I attended to the con Congress, which was dedicated to uh, two works of Bolzano. It was in Prague, and at that time, I was interested in formalization of Bolzano contingency, contingency sorry, argument for the existence of God. I did it uh, uh, using uh, uh, unitary theory of uh, sets and individuals. And so I, uh, how to say, I obtained quite nice formalism. But at that time, I met also uh, in, in this in Prague, uh, Professor Peter Dvorak uh, from Czech Republic. And uh, he had a very interesting lecture in which he uh, um, uh, justified his hypothesis that this uh, Bolzano uh, argumentation is very similar to the argumentation of Ibn Sina. And uh, this was uh, somehow interesting, very interesting for me because between these two philosophers, there are decades <laughs> of history of philosophy. And moreover, I got to know that probably Bolzano didn't know this argument given by, uh, by Avicenna. Uh, maybe uh, there were some connections uh, uh, between Bolzano and Avicenna via uh, one argumentation given by Leibniz. In fact, um, Bolzano concerning his philosophy had this Aristotelian roots, but also very uh, strong platonic tendencies. And because of them, he was even called Bohemian Leibniz or small Leibniz. So perhaps maybe via Leibniz, he was infected by this idea, which was already present by uh, 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 in Avicenna works. But however, I wanted to check if it is really like that, if Professor Peter Dvorak is right, Right, or maybe not. And uh, in conclusion, I should say that uh, this is true that these argumentations are similar concerning main, main steps. They have very similar structure or even the same, but Avicenna proof is much more, how to say, detailed and uh, is richer, let's say, because of uh, steps in derivations and also because of uh, many axioms new, which uh, is, which are not present in uh, the material given by, uh, by Bolzano. 
So uh, this was my, uh, my idea at the beginning. And I took again the same formal background. It means this in, the, in this unitary theory of individuals and sets. In fact, this theory is a kind of a mariage of uh, set theory. Uh, um, uh, and uh, meteorology originally formulated by a uh, Polish logician, um, uh, Professor Andrzej Kietruszczak. And this was my background, but we will come to this background uh, uh, just when I present my formalization. So it was a small introduction. I have two pictures of these two great philosophers. Um, maybe I will start with a very short characteristic of Bolzano. Maybe it is uh, uh, nice to know uh, that uh, he, uh, of course, he was known mathematician, philosopher, but also he, he was specialist in theology, especially in Catholic theology because he was Catholic priest. Uh, he was born in Prague, he died in Prague, and, uh, but, but he had a period as a Catholic priest uh, when he was ordered to be silent uh, by the Catholic Church because of his very liberal um, uh, concepts concerning um, political philosophy or social philosophy. However, during this time, he also worked and he wrote a book, the title Lehrbuch der Religion Wissenschaft. It was in uh, 1834 and officially it was published not under his name, but it was anonymous and it was only declared that it was uh, 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 that it is a collection of lectures made by him and it was prepared by his by, by his students. And in this Lehrbuch, there is this interesting book, uh, this interesting proof, uh, chapter 30, no, sorry, 67, but maybe we will not go in detail in this proof because I am focused now more in approach of formalizing Avicenna proof. Concerning Avicenna, he was uh, 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 writing in Arabic, and for me it is a uh, quite a big problem because I don't know Arabic. Uh, however, I uh, used a very known and uh, excellent translation made by Professor Marmura, especially this fragment from the work Nayat. This is the picture of the title book. Uh, this is the title, uh, uh, I mean, cover of this, of this book. In fact, he came to this argument in four places of his work. And, uh, uh, but, but I took this, mo this most famous, let's say, or most known. And also this uh, text was considered by uh, Professor Dvorak. So it was justification that I took just text from Nayat. So uh, these are these papers of Avicenna, Bolzano, Lerbuch der, Wissenschaft, der Religion Wissenschaft. And what uh, maybe I should add uh, uh, in some small comment that Bolzano uh, proof was already uh, formalized by Professor Gantaler and Professor Simons in, in 1987. They made this formalization with the use of set theoretical tools. And in fact, this was my motivation in 2014 that I enriched somehow and reformulate this formalization given by Gantaler and Simons. So maybe now we will go to PDF, I mean to my second document in which I have a source text, because if we want to go through some formalization, there is no way out. So simply we have to read very shortly this uh, fragment which we want to formalize. So please, uh, I will change my picture. I am sorry if I am not very fluent in using this electronic devices, but maybe it will not so bad. Uh, do you see the text? Yes. Okay. Then let, let me let me read. It is there are only seven points. In fact, this numeration was uh, invented by me. This is written without any numbers. But uh, uh, maybe when you will see these numbers, it will be better to look at these axioms, which are effect of formalization. So Avicenna says as follows: There is no doubt that there is existence. Every existence is either necessary or possible. 
If necessary, then it would be true that the necessary exists, which is the thing being sought after. If possible, we will make it evident that the existence of the possible terminates with necessary existent. In the second big step we read, before showing the latter, we will set down premises on one of which is that for each thing that in itself is possible, there cannot be at any one time an infinite of causes that are themselves possible. This is because all of these causes would either coexist or not coexist. Let us, however, postpone discussion of the latter alternative where the infinite does not coexist in one time, each of its components existing before the other. For the infinite to coexist, however, without including a necessary existence. Such an aggregate in, in as much as it is that aggregate, regardless of whether it is finite or infinite, must then be itself necessary or possible in existence. If the aggregate is necessary in itself, when each of its components is possible in itself, then the necessary existence would subsist in things that are possible in themselves, which is self-contradictory. On the other hand, if the aggregate is possible in itself, then it requires for its existence that which bestows existence. This bestower of existence would then be either external to the aggregate or included in it. If included in it, then it is either the case that one of its members would be necessary existent when each member is a possible existent which is contradictory, or it would be contingent, in which case it would be the, case, the cause of the existence of the aggregate. But the cause of the existence of the aggregate is, first of all, a cause of the existence in its parts, of which it is one. Hence, it would be a cause of itself. This, in addition of being impossible, if true, would be the very thing that is sought for anything which is sufficient for bringing about its own existence is necessary in existence, but we have supposed it to be necessary and this is contradictory. And last part, it remains then that the bestower of existence is externus, the aggregate of the aggregate, but it cannot be a cause that is contingent for we have brought together every cause that is contingent within the aggregate. Hence, the best hour of existence is externus to the aggregate and in itself necessary existence. All possible existence hence terminate in a cause that is necessary in existence. Hence, it is impossible that every contingent has an infinite number of contingent cases. Let's uh, uh, summarize somehow the main steps which are simply crucial in this argumentation. The idea is that he stays there is something existent, and then he is thinking, okay, if it is possible in existence or necessary. If necessary, we have it. If possible, then we make uh, some general set in which there are all real but possible things, which are causes of something else. And then we make it, I mean, we make a distributive set, then we make from out of it, if it is not empty, an aggregate, and we ask, what about this aggregate? If it is necessary, then we have it. If not, <laughs> then the reason must be inside or outside. If the reason is inside, then because everything, what is a cause of an aggregate, it is the cause of all its parts, then it would be the cause of itself, which cannot be because the relation of cause is irreflexive. So it must be outside. And because it is outside, it cannot be possible because we put already all possible in our aggregate. So it is necessary. So this is, let's say, a, a general structure of this proof. And really, it is very similar to Bolzano, 
uh, text and to Bolzano formalization, which I had this great pleasure to prepare. I will not go in Bolzano text, but by the way, I will show you similarities and uh, at the end, I will show you the main differences. So we go back to my presentation on slides. <laughs> We went through the PDF and now we are here. Before we will start to make these formalizations bold, of course, we have to know what is the ground, formal ground. Formal ground, as I told you, it is this marriage of set theory together with meteorology. All these things is based on the first order logic with identity. Here you have a characterizations of our characterization of our theory. So we take all tautologies of first order logic with identity, then we have Zermelo bank axioms for Z, Z is to be set and for Epsilon to be a member, and then we have definitions and axioms for part relation and other specific notions of meteorology. So we read in two first axioms that, I mean, this horseshoe, this nice uh, two-place predicate, this horseshoe is, uh, 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 is to be read, X is a part of Y. So we see that to be a part of Y is asymmetric. The second axiom tells you that it is transitive. The third uh, introduced uh, the notion of being ingredients. X is ingredient, ingredient sorry, of Y if and only if it is a part or it is equal to Y. Then we have definition of uh, cross objects. Objects cross just when they have something in common, which, which uh, is an ingredient of both. Uh, then you have a notion of being X external, external one to each other. To be external means simply not to be to, to be crossed. Finally, you have rather complicated notion of meteorological sun. As you see, this sigma, this sigma should be read X is meteorological sum of Z. And this means that at first, Z must be a distributive set. Simply we make it like we would make a glue <laughs> from these elements which are in this normal set. But uh, uh, what, what's more, I mean, if something is element of this set, then it must be an ingredient or simply a part is of this X, which is a meteorological sum. And if there is something, uh, I mean, if for any ingredient of X, it must be that there is some element in Z which cross this Y, which is an ingredient of, of X. Uh, the next two axioms are, uh, are uh, also from meteorology. The first tells you that when, I mean, the alpha three tells you that if X and Y are meteorological sums of the same set, simply they are identical, then, the last, I mean, alpha four tells you that you cannot, if you want to make a meteorological sum of any set, this set must be not empty. <laughs> yes, empty set, uh, it has not, not, no, no meteorological uh, sum, uh, um, sum. And then the last one, which links the notion of the set with the notion of a part, uh, this last one tells you that if something is a set in the set theoretical sense, it has no parts. We would say that meteorological, I mean, from the, no, from the point of view of meteorology, these distributive sets are atoms in frame of this theory. So we have this machinery. There are many beautiful, important th theorems, but in fact, we don't need such a big uh, car to, uh, to go through. We, we need only a part of it. And we go to our formalizations. First, we start with Avicenna. Uh, we will call our new uh, theory, which is based on this uh, ZFM. Uh, we will call it AA. We take the following uh, primitive uh, predicates. A, I mean, E, X means X is existent. Net X, it means X is necessary. Pause X, it means X is possible in itself. 
x are y, it means x is a sufficient uh, cos of y. And then we take also individual constant a, which will be the set which is made out of this whole real possible things which are causes of something. But this will be explained in our axiom a, 1a. So we start with uh, the following axioms. First, a1, there is something which is existent. Then the second one, if something exists, it is only necessary or possible. And as you see, this or is uh, 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 ex exclu exclusive or. Then the, th uh, the third axiom tells you how to understand this uh, constant A. Namely, constant A, uh, as you see, it, uh, it named the set and something belongs to it. It only if, only and only if it is existent, it is possible and it is a cause of something. And here is a main bigger difference between Bolzano and Avicenna because Bolzano makes a set out of, uh, of real things which has some cause. And here he makes a set of real things which are causes of something and also possible. And so uh, the next axiom is that if our A, we don't know if it is not empty here, it is not decided, but if it would be not empty, then this meteorological sum exists. The next axiom tells you that if X is meteorological sum of Y and in Y you have only objects which are possible, not necessary, then also this X cannot be necessary. Uh, then the next axiom tells you that if something is possible and existent, then there exists something which is a cause of this X and is uh, real. Finally, you have axiom five. If Z is meteorological sum of X and Y is a cause of Z, then Y is inside of this Z or Y is outside of this Z and here, Again, there is a big difference between Bolzano and, and Avicenna, namely Bolzano just in advance decide that if you have any aggregate, not any, but let's say this aggregate which, we, which he planned for us, and if it is not necessary, then this cause must be outside. So he has only this part and Avicenna is, let's say, weaker. He said, okay, let's take it as a part or as outside. And then he will exclude this part of this disjunction just by these two axioms, which are not present in Bolzano text. The uh, axiom A6 tells you that if Y is a cause of X, then Y is a cause of all parts of X. And this is present in this argumentation of Avicenna. And finally, the last one is quite obvious, uh, uh, obvious axiom that causality is irreflexive. And surely Bolzano also had it in, a, in, in other places in his works. But here, I mean, in this proof, he didn't use it. And of course, the main, main uh, game is to uh, to get this uh, nice theorem that there exists something which is necessary. So, concerning Bolzano, as I told you, uh, again, this premise is the same. I'm sorry here, we should say, what about primitive notions? V, it is real existence. A B, it is X is conditioned. X R Y is like before X is sufficient cause of Y. G X is, is X a God. And then there is constant B, which is used to formulate this axiom A B one. And as I told already, there is a difference. Okay. Okay, so we have axioms. Now we have to make these deductions. How to do it? So we go to PDF.
Avicenna has these axioms, which you already notice, I mean, which, you, which I already described. And his proof is like that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I will not go in details because I have nice drawing to show you on, uh, uh, on a picture how this derivation goes. However, there are two essential steps which are really similar to Bolzano, namely the step one, please look, we assume that there exists something which is existent, and then we say it is necessary or it is not necessary. If it is necessary, then we are ready. If it is not necessary, then we go here until 2.4. Here we say that, okay, this object is necessary again or not necessary and again two four if this first part of alternative is true we are ready if not then we go here and from this second part this derivation very long derivation goes to the conclusion in uh, point one to seventeen that there exists something which is necessary so we can close the proof also on this second level and then we have on this first level our conclusion. Proof of Bolzano is not so horrible, <laughs> I mean, but it has also similar steps and this is Professor Tvorak was perfectly right. He thought there exists something which is virkly, real, then Let's assume that it is not conditioned or conditioned. It is by classical logic when you take this first. So it is the same step. If it is not conditioned, then we are ready. If it is conditioned that we are going here until 2.5 to say it is not conditioned or conditioned. Again, if it is true, then we are ready. But here, as you remember here, it is the derivation in Avicenna from 1 to 1 until 1 to 17. And here it is very short because axioms are very strong. Again, thanks to these derivations, we can close the second level and then we can close the first level. And we need, it is a cosmetic thing, only this last, last step because of definition of God. Okay, then we can go to our slides. Now, Bolzano can be, I mean, this proof of Bolzano can have, I mean, I picture it like that. As you see, this main conclusion always close one of the alternatives and then finally close the whole proof. Sorry, here, I, here it will be better. And the main theorem, it is there exists something which is real and which is, which is unconditioned. Concerning Avicenna, you see, you have here the same step, here the same step, but all this thing here, all this thing, it is missed. I mean missed, it is not present in, in Bolzano approach. So maybe now we could also compare these theories uh, a little bit. Of course, it depends what, would like, what we would like to know. If we want to know how much Bolzano is in Avicenna or how much Avicenna is in Bolzano. <laughs> I, uh, I have chosen this first question, how much Bolzano is in Avicenna. It means that I took the language of Bolzano and I translated it in the language of Avicenna. It is really very simple. It is only needed to take uh, for the predicate W, a predicate a, it is wirklich and this is existent and for being conditioned it is possible, nothing more. 
we will also add to the language of, uh, of our formalism a, a constant B. And about this B, as you remember, maybe it is this set of all conditioned individuals, which is different to the set which was formulated by Avicenna, but we will take the set or I mean this uh, uh, individual constant also in our AA and we will add uh, the following two axioms to AA. Uh, these axioms are about the nature of this B, simply to be able to, to compare it. What we can see. We can see that, of course, first premise uh, belongs also to Avicenna's theory, but nothing more. Axioms A3, axioms A4, uh, sorry, here it should be B, it is my, my mistake. They are not elements of, of Avicenna's theory, and moreover, they are even not comparable with A4 and A5 from, uh, 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 from Avicenna. Pro, not Avicenna approach, but from my approach to Avicenna text. What uh, should be said, just which I said before, that everything which is in the set formulated by Avicenna is already in a set formulated by Bolzan. <clears throat> what about models? Uh, this theories translated in one language, in, in Avicenna language, they are in this sense not comparable that they cross each other. There are some theories in common. They are, there are some theorems uh, uh, characteristic for Bolzano and there are some, uh, some theorems uh, characteristics for, characteristic for Avicenna. But nevertheless, we can think about at least few uh, models which are somehow uh, not somehow, which are common to both these approaches. We will consider here only a fragment of Bolzano uh, theory, which, uh, was which is characterized by our axioms and with this meteorological axioms and uh, concerning this uh, theoretical ax uh, th set theoretical axiom, we will take only this extensionality axiom and the axiom of the existence of the empty set, not nothing more. And the same we will make with, uh, with Avicenna's theory. We will in fact consider some very tiny fragments of them. And here, I mean, one thing is nice because we know that these theories are, <laughs> are consistent because we found models, but these models also show that this syntactic, uh, 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 syntactic level and also meanings, intended meanings, they are not really very, very, how to say, uh, rich, uh, this, I mean, described in semantics. Semantics really gives some small models. For example, we can imagine that we have the universe in which we have a counterpart uh, of this, of this uh, uh, Bolzano set, as uh, this Bolzano individual constant, and G, which is planned to be godlike being. Uh, because in our universe only B star is uh, set, uh, then it means that this must be an empty set. <laughs> Uh, concerning predicates of uh, W and, and B, we will take W, it is only this godlike being is real. Concerning this B, it is empty. I mean, there are no conditioned individuals. Concerning uh, uh, um, relation of being element, uh, part of relation and causality, let's assume that they are empty. Look, in such a poor model, all this theory is okay. I mean, this is a model for this theory where you have only God, nothing more. <laughs> but from the other side, when you start this derivation, you see even that, uh, I mean, there is some intuition. You can take only, you can find only one real which is necessary and then you are ready. If not, then you go farther. The proof starts in this way. Uh, this model is also uh, is, uh, uh, good for Avicenna theory. Then we take a, a model where you, when we have a little bit more rich universe, let's say that we have empty set, this is by axiom, then we have air 
R, sorry, which is the only one element of B, and G, which is planned to be godlike being. Uh, when we interpret our predicates and our uh, uh, and and uh, these relations in, in such a way as it is done here, maybe I will not go in details. It is also a good model for our theory, uh, but this model is not good for Avicenna theory. Uh, so uh, we there are some possibilities to modify this model, but uh, however, it would be necessary to consider two specific formulas if we could add it to our Avicenna formalism or not. I will not go in details. And there is the third model, maybe very interesting. Look at this here. There are three objects. G uh, star and G prime star and B star. B star, again, it is planned as uh, uh, this uh, Bolzano uh, big set and, and, uh, or, uh, or also set of, uh, or, of all real possible causes, like it is in case of, uh, of Avicenna. And this is interesting that these two are such that they are real, they are not conditioned, and G star is a part of G prime star. And both are okay to be considered as godlike beings. So in uh, principle, this theory does not exclude the situation that God is a kind of aggregate. Of course, it does not follow intention of Bolzano. Bolzano explicitly says in other fragments of his philosophical discourse that he uh, his intention is that God is a substance. And this again is a difference between him and Avicenna. Avicenna even made in his physics uh, a proof uh, for the existence of the first mover from the observation of substances which are which are moving, let's say. Uh, so very similar to the proof of Aristotle, but he uh, explicitly said that this what he proved is not a god because god is not substance in his uh, in his discourse so these are some materials which are used thank you this is all thank you very much for <laughs> this really inspiring yeah. for me personally for, for sure and, uh, and i think for all of you um thank you. And now, um, before the questions session, uh, we have, as, as I told you before, maybe not, not everybody was present, uh, we have the second part, uh, namely the short presentation by our young researchers from the University of Warsaw, um, Michał Pawłowski and Bartosz Wesu, both from the uh, Academic Association, Student Association of Logic and Philosophy of Religion. Uh, Michał Pawłowski um, graduated from the University of Warsaw. Um, he's interested in uh, self-referential augmentations, limits of knowledge uh, in metaphysics, uh, early Wittgenstein and philosophy of science. He's also an author of a book, even if he's a really young researcher, he, he published a book in a very prominent uh, publishing house in Poland. Uh, uh, its title is On Limits of Knowledge, Metaphysically and Illa Cisifatem. So it's a mirror reflection of metaphysically. Yeah, very interesting book. We, we hope it will be in English maybe soon. Um, and um, Bartosz Wesu uh, is a second year master's stu student, soon a, ma a master, I think, in philosophy, and the president of this uh, student association. Um, and his uh, academic interest, in, interests are Kantian philosophy, philosophy of physics, and logic and philosophy of religion, of course. So, uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Please tell us about your results. Uh, uh, um, and maybe first, I would like to ask uh, Michal Pawlowski to present his part, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this uh, warm invitation, Dr. Trepczyński, and thanks, of, of course, to, to all uh, webinar organizers for the opportunity to present it, and of course to you, Professor Świętorzecka, for giving us time uh, to present. 
Mm, yeah, so I'll share my screen and yeah, I had some problems with my second screen. So hopefully it will all go smoothly. Uh, I hope so. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we can see, but with uh, it's not a full screen presentation. Okay. We can see also mm. the list of slides. Okay, so now. Oh, no, um, okay, perfect. Yes, please. Okay, because the problem is, just give me a second, please. Can, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's all about the second screen. Uh, and do you, do you, uh, yeah, yeah, moment, please. Yeah, technical issues sometimes are too problematic. So do you still see the presentation or a text? I mean, uh, I can see, we can see the PowerPoint. Slide, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, okay, that's good. Uh, then unfortunately, I'm afraid I cannot make the full, full screen view. Full screen I hope it's fine for you. Okay, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll go to the first slide. Uh, so the title of our paper is God and Timeless Cognition. Um, and here we deal with, uh, yeah, based on Gödel's argument for the non-existence of time, we aim to model uh, God's timeless cognition. So that is, if God were to perceive the world timelessly, as Christian mainstream from Augustinus and Beatrice has it, so what would this cognition then be like? And we want to present some theoretical hardships resulting from assuming the non-existence of time and your possible solution, which may be found in Leibniz monadology, as we think. Mm, and uh, please note that we don't argue for time's non-existence. We assume it in regard to God's epistemological relation to the world, in line with the interpretation of Gödel's argument provided by polyorgraph. Thus, we are also not going to face this reasoning, Gödel's reasoning with counter-arguments. We presume its correctness and apply it to the problem of God's cognition. Mm, and another important in introductory disclaimer is that we base our presentation on our papers, one written by Bartosz and one by me, uh, submitted to the Kurt Kettel Award 2021, organized by the Kurt Kettel Front of Christ Berlin. Mm, and first, uh, uh, the papers order, oh, okay, it's this slide uh, still. So first, I will, I will start with presenting the dilemma resulting from the non-existence of time. Uh, time understood as flux of intuitive now, uh, which this dilemma goes as follows. Either we resign from the world's orderliness or we abandon the individual subject. And then Bartosz will sketch the Leibnizian answer to both of these problems and show how God's cognition on Leibniz account can avoid those problems. Uh, and we'll start shortly with a brief presentation of Gödel's argument. Uh, for the non-existence of time. So in, in, for, in 1949, Gödel proved that Einstein's gravitational field equations entail a possible existence of a rotating universe. Uh, such a universe can be characterized, um, which is quite funny, by the occurrence of closed time loops. And those, ta those time loops in principle mean that time traveling would be possible in such a world. It's only a model, a, po a possible world. And at the same time, as Jorgo has it, uh, his Gödel's view on model features, features of time was similar to the one he held in regard to God. Uh, we can compare it, for example, with ontological argument, uh, which was recently presented here on, on webinar. Uh, so we can say we, Gedelians, expect the time to be such and such in all possible worlds, if it is so in just one possible world. So if there is a possible world where time loops exist and consequently the flux of intuitive now, intuitive time is distorted, uh, it is also the case in all possible worlds, which means that time seems to doesn't exist, uh, according to Gadol. And what does it mean? Uh, how does a timeless world present itself to the cognizing subject here, good, uh, if we assume the correctness of this of this argument? And following, uh, I'll go to the second slide, uh, and that's the first part of this dilemma. Uh, following the Kantian tradition of thinking about time as a precondition or form of phenomenal world, all possible experience, which is not quite out of place based on Gödel's own fondness for the philosophy of Kant. So uh, then we may say that time as the inner sense next to the external sense space allows for organizing experience of outside objects and inside intuitions so that they can be pursued by a cognizing subject. Kant famously calls it the synthesis of experience. He devotes a good deal of work to show how time can condition our experience as its form. 
However, a more general and independent of his earlier assumptions argument can be found in the part of critic purism called refutation of idealism, as well as in the critic of judgment. Uh, in short, apart from, uh, apart from showing that reliable measurements of time require existence of the outside world, otherwise no frame of reference for such a procedure would be provided, Kant argues that measurements of space require time as well. All spatial scales can be expressed with a reference to different metrics. At the end of the day, however, the search for more privative terms describing these very measures demand employing temporal intervals, such as expressing distance by time needed to walk it, for example. Uh, because if we could, doing some spatial me measurements, refer only to some other spatial metrics directly translatable to the originally used ones, how could we provide reliability of those measurements? We need to say it, in other words, a kind of external point of reference. Consequently, both space determines time and the other way around, time determines space. Losing the temporal order, we also lose the spatial one. Mm, and how, uh, how a world without time and thus without the synthesis of experience as well could look like shows the following paragraph from the Critic of Purism. I just make sure you still see it, the, this paragraph, right? Everything's right with the presentation, yes. Okay, so maybe I, I won't read it aloud and restrict myself just to saying that what we can see here is how Kant understands the world without the synthesis of experience based on time and causal chains. It's a kind of mere chaos. We see the cinnabar changing its color very yeah, unorderly. Uh, yeah, a man just changing his or her shape. It's, yeah, it's, it's chaos. But however, uh, it all doesn't have to mean that without time, the phenomenal world would simply disappear in an imperceptible chaos, as Kant here tries to convince us. Uh, maybe I'll go back to the previous slide. Yeah, it could also well be that we would be left with a somehow chaotic universe, though still perceptible and cognizable, and cognizable, sorry, as Quentin Miyasu argues in his short book on science fiction and Kant. Without delving into too much detail, let me just say that according to Miyasu, the Kantian scenario is only one of three types of a chaotic world. In two other types of this chaotic worlds, the irregularities wouldn't be big enough to rule the ex existence of consciousness. We could still imagine worlds where the non-existence of laws of nature would cause some disturbances to science, in one possible scenario, even presumably denying its possibility, yet conscious life would still survive. We still could perceive the world. It would be inordinately yet perceptible. So let's, let's formulate the first consequence of the non-existence of time, the first part of the dilemma, uh, which is that the world without time into the flux of now could possibly be still in existence, yet deprived of order. In this scenario, the causal laws are also endangered. At the same time, the presence or at least possibility of a conscious self would be maintained. Quite differently looks the alternative, the alternative uh, possibility. Mm. And here, if we look, if we go to the second part of the dilemma, and if we look closer at the thesis formulated by Gödel, affirming the possibility of time travels, which leads necessarily to the non-existence of time, one should ask, who travels? First, let us imagine that I or any other individual can travel in time. Then possibly I could participate in events from the distant past or future, but what if I tried to re-experience events from my own life? It doesn't appear problematic as long as I do not try to imagine my presence by events such as my own birth, for example. Uh, would I reappear in the world then, or simply would I exist in two copies? The former would contradict the reality of time travels, the latter in turn would cancel the reality of self. If in a time travel I can meet myself and look upon myself, or even interact with myself from outside, maybe it's not me who travels, who is it then? Again, in reference to the transcendental tradition, the traveling self could be called a transcendental ego. By very definition, it would be something different than an empirical self instantiated in our everyday experience. The transcendental ego would constitute conditions of the phenomenal world's reality, not being itself its part. Its perspective would necessarily contain an element of timelessness, rendering it close to how San Agustin imagined the divine perspective. Moreover, the transcendental ego would be reducible to the structure of the world being a kind of its scaffolding. From such a transcendental pers perspective, there is neither any relativity nor a contingently distinguished frame of reference. World becomes truly permanidean. Namely, if we got a kind of fixed point of reference outside of the world, then all contingency and relativity 
which we can see in this empirical world, it's in fact not not rel relative and not not contingent. It all becomes, as I said, yeah, very Parmenidean. The, this world would have nothing nothing chaotic at all. It would be a timeless vision lacking any relativity or individual perspective. That's also lacking a conscious empirical subject as incapable of a fully objective external perspective from nowhere. Here in this proposition, the world's orderliness is saved, yet at the cost of the subject's disappearance. The remaining transcendental ego is rather the world, its structure than the self. What we are left with is a timeless world with a conscious, without a conscious subject, unlike in the first scenario when the, where the non-existence of time entails the inevitability of chaos after the collapse of the time-based synthesis of experience. So we've got then two possible consequences entailed by the non-existence of time. First, that the synthesis of experience and thus cognition of the world as something orderly and governed by the causal laws are impossible. And the second, that the causal temporal structure of the world is maintained, however, at the cost of understanding the world itself as an unchangeable Parmenidian transcendental framework, devoid of any individual perspective. When speaking about God, does it mean that from his perspective, the world can be seen only as a mere cause, or that we should abandon speaking about him, God, as a person in Christian tradition, three persons or a subject. In our view, a satisfactory answer can be found in Leibniz's monadology. And this part will be presented now by Bartosz. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for having us. Um, without further ado, uh, in the first part of the dilemma as presented by Michał, uh, without the objective time, there is a danger of losing the world's orderliness, its structure. Uh, but are we then doomed to chaos? That's the question. Uh, and to answer it, we first need to examine in what part is the, the world's structure dependent on time. Uh, and also, let me come back to, to, to Kant and present one other essential features of his concept of time. Uh, namely that, as presented on the slide, uh, time is in itself a series and the formal condition of all series. And as such, uh, time serves, serves as a basis for our intuitive notion of causation. Uh, so insofar as causation is viewed as a series of causes and effects, it is time dependent. And so is the world's causal structure. Uh, it then seems that if we were to abandon the objective time, uh, this objective flow flux of, of uh, now, we would have to abandon the, the world's causal structure. And our situation becomes even worse when we follow Kant in his other remark uh, presented on the slide that causality uh, leads to the concept of action, this to the concept of, of force, and thereby to the concept of substance. So if we are forced to abandon the time-dependent concept of causality, um, which shapes our concept of substance, the, the fundamental notion of whole metaphysics, uh, the world without time and so the world as it is perceived by God uh, would require a radically different metaphysics. Uh, and as I will try to, to show, it may be Leibnizian monadology. Uh, so uh, let me start with, with a few remarks about our intuitive time dependent notion of causation. Uh, so with some simplification, it can be viewed as the causation of the pool balls. So pool balls interact with each other directly. And in principle, we can easily distinguish cause from effect at the same time setting the temporal order of events, when, of, where of course uh, cause happens always earlier than, than the effect. Uh, but in, in Gödel's universe, without this objective flux of now, uh, where the closed time loops are possible, uh, this conception of causality would certainly fall. Uh, nevertheless, maybe we could just broaden or 
uh, modify our notion of causality and try to make it time independent. And before we consider a, a Leibnizian answer to that, uh, let us note that even in the good old Newtonian physics, the, the causality of pull balls could be insufficient. Uh, what was famously pointed out by uh, Bertrand Russell, whose quotation we have here, um, maybe let, let me just read it. Uh, all philosophers of every school imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms of or postulates of science. Oddly enough, in advanced sciences such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never occurs. In the motion of mutually gravitating bodies, there is nothing that can be called a cause and nothing that can be called an effect. So maybe one can yeah, one could try to save the, the category of causation by saying that it is the gravitational force that causes this motion, but it certainly takes us far from the intuitive notion of causality, causality of the pull balls, uh, even in case of Newtonian gravity. So for example, the, the Earth orbiting around the sun. Uh, and I think situation could be even worse for this intuitive notion of causality uh, in fully ge geometry sized general relativity uh, and quantum mechanics with its indeterministic and non-local processes. So we are then in need for a different time independent notion of causality, uh, which indicates different metaphysics. Fortunately, there already is one worth considering, namely Leibniz monadology. Uh, so I will give only a few points that uh, I think show that Leibniz theory coincides with, with our needs for, for different causality. Uh, so first, in, this, in his metaphysical system, substances don't interact causally in the intuitive sense. As we have it on the slide, monads have no windows. The natural changes in monads come from an internal principle, since an external cause could not influence their interior. Second, uh, even though there is no intuitive causal order in the world of monads, there is a specific orderliness, specific harmony, as Leibniz's concept of pre-established harmony has it. So even though uh, substances don't interact with each other, changes of their attributes are perfectly harmonized and every single monad is connected to every other one by a specific relation, more basic uh, metaphysically than the causal relation. Uh, third, in Leibniz's system, uh, there nevertheless is room for causality, though understood more abstractly than the intuitive one. Uh, and a, a Polish philosopher of physics uh, from Poznań, Marek Woszczek, argues in his paper that Leibnizian metaphysics could serve as a conceptual background for causality in a new physical theory uh, for there to be found that would unite general relativity and quantum physics. So he uses also Leibnizian metaphysics to, to show that. Uh, fourth, uh, God's cognition, timeless cognition, cannot depend on intuitive causes based on the idea of time. Uh, God's knowledge of the world doesn't require investigating the external causes, uh, causal relations, external uh, with reference to, to the substances. Uh, God could just look inside the monad's internal principle to, so to say, decode its whole history and even the history and future of the entire universe. Uh, and I think all of this points to the conclusion that Leibniz monadology may account for the world as it is con cognized by God, a timeless world. Uh, and now uh, going to the second uh, part of the alternative described by Michał. 
uh, where there could be no empirical self, there is a danger of lo losing God's selfness. So if uh, God perceives time, uh, perceives the world timelessly, uh, could we maintain his subjectivity? Uh, and moreover, uh, if we would identify him with the transcendental ego discussed by, by Michal, uh, he would be, God could be reduced to the world's structure and lose his transcendent, transcendent being, which is of course problematic for the traditional Christian doctrine, uh, though maybe not so much for those with more uh, pantheistic inclinations. And surprisingly enough, uh, I think Leibnizian metaphysics can possibly be an answer to that as well. Uh, so on, on Leibniz's account, God is the highest infinite monad who embraces all the internal orderliness of all finite monads. He sees and establishes the order of all orders. Uh, he is obviously not a let's say, regular empirical subject, but maintains some form of subjectivity. Uh, and at the same time, God on, on Leibniz's account cannot be identified with the world's orderliness and has transcend transcendent independent existence. Uh, and to see that, uh, a short example, we can consider Leibniz's conception of creation. So God, as fully independent being, chose to create one particular world from many other possibilities. As we all know, the best of all possible worlds. So he established one particular harmony, one world structure from many, many possible. Uh, moreover, this conception of creation shows that God can be seen as a subject or a person who, is, who has a will of choosing this particular universe uh, and not, not any other possible, uh, who's then free uh, and etc. Okay, and to, to conclude, um, we are trying to show that the world without time, so the world as it is perceived by God, would look radically different and trying to understand exactly how it would look like may force us to abandon some of our very fundamental uh, concepts like intuitive causation or the self. And in our opinion, Leibniz metaphysics, which at first glance seems very exotic and counterintuitive, uh, is worth considering with, when modeling God's timeless cognition and maybe may help us in overcoming some of these conceptual problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very impelling talk. Um, the most important uh, information is that the world is safe. Yeah, <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, and, and what's interesting, I think, is that generally um, uh, Kant was to be um, a solution for the former metaphysics, yeah, but this time it's the the other way around, yeah. So the Leibniz is a solution for the problem with with Kant, if we if we assume that the time loops are possible. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we have the questions and answers question uh, session. Uh, so please refer to the first. Um, uh, speech of Professor Kordua Świętorzecka or, or to, to the second speech by Michał Pawłowski and Bartosz Wesoł, I, I hope, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so please uh, show us if you, if you want to ask any, uh, and please do. Are there any questions? Because... I cannot see any of them. Oh, yes, uh, Professor Świętorzewska wanted to ask a question. There are no questions, but uh, I have two answers. 
Hello? Okay. And next day, Paul. Uh, uh, yes, I just I got I, I got two emails uh, uh, from participants. Thank you very much. And there was somebody who asked me about the source of I mean translation of Avicenna. And uh, I don't know if this person is here with us, but uh, I took uh, I took a translation of Professor Mar Mura from I, I will uh, tell you in a moment. Uh, it is for 19 from 1984. Uh, he wrote a paper about this uh, arguments um, uh, in um, Shifa. It is the metaphysics of of Avicenna and he had this hypothesis that uh, also in this place this um, proof is presented but it is very divided in many places of the whole metaphysics and just at the end of this article he gave this translation and I used it so thank you very much and now we have a question from Paul Healy and then Christopher Menzel oh please yeah ask. yes yeah thank you Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, it's very interesting, the talk. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is um, the irreflexive uh, causality, being irreflexive. I've also heard the term of it being synchronous, you know, cause being synchronous with effect. Um, and also the idea that maybe the, um, the cause, uh, understanding causality is perhaps a foundation, you could argue, which from religious ideas are derived. Um, so I'm thinking in terms of final cause and efficient cause, and I just wondered if you might sort of be able to expand on that uh, in comparison to the two philosophers you're talking about, because I was a bit confused, really. I am um, sorry, then maybe I should be more clear. Both had yeah. in their minds this efficient cause, not, uh, uh, not other, and yeah. both uh, were uh, aware uh, that there is this theory of four uh, types of causes by uh, by Aristotle, and both explicitly said that it cannot happen that uh, uh, anything is a cause of itself. Uh, so, and this only was needed here for this formalization, but of course it should be more elaborated and maybe there we could build, uh, surely we could build richer theory about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Christopher Menzel, please. And yeah, then... thanks very much. Uh, let me turn on my video. Yeah, thanks very much for a, a super interesting uh, talk. I'm referring to the first talk. Forgive me if I can't pronounce your last name. <laughs> um, uh, so just a couple of quick questions about the formalization. So you use the the e predicate for existent so um so uh since you're using first order logic if you mean that to be just general existence that would be a definable predicate i take it so i'll just say get these two questions out because they're related uh and if it's not then i was wondering if because you also it seemed the corresponding predicate in uh, bolzano's argument was the w for wirklich and for Bolzano, Wirklich implied, since he was a possibilist, he, he took Wirklich to mean existence in space and time, so being part of the causal, or at least being part of the causal order, so that God might count as, as Wirklich in that sense. Um, so I was wondering, if, if the E is just definable in first order logic, then it's, it's, ex, it's extraneous to the, it would be extraneous to the argument. So I'm wondering if the distinction between merely possible things, which it seems uh, even Sina also accepted as, as well as Bethano, I'm wondering if your E predicate is meaning to mark this distinction between merely possible things, like merely possible people, Mm -hmm. and actual things things in the causal order because if so then it's then it it needs to be there as a primitive predicate but if it's just for general being so that it encompasses everything in the domain of the quantifiers then it it would be extraneous 
uh, just I will answer. I am sorry for my English, but I will try to, uh, to at first I will I will try to explain what I know about the notion of existence in case of Bolzano and how I treated it in my formalization. As I have read uh, in Guinness and also Marmura uh, and also in other, uh, um, let's say, uh, comments to, uh, to Avicenna, uh, rather commentators uh, agree that the notion of existence in a sense of my E, it is primitive notion and mm -hmm. it cannot be defined via uh, uh, simply uh, existential quantifier because there are also objects which do not exist in sense of E, but they are in the domain. Uh, so in this sense, it cannot be defined. It is primitive. And uh, more all, and this is explicitly told by Avicenna. Uh, Avicenna tells that we cannot uh, uh, explain the notion of existence and even we cannot justify empirically uh, existential in sense of e, e, e uh, sentences because if you say some existential sentence of some about some individual you have already assumed that it is existent <laughs> so there right. is uh, and and he is explicitly uh, uh, in this i mean he explicitly say these things then he takes also these two notions, these modalities, possibility and necessity. And concerning possibility, it is not, uh, uh, I mean, something can be possible, but it can not exist in sense of a. Eh. I mean, in sense of this E predicate, yes. So there mm. are some possibilities which are not existent. And these which are existent, he tells that they are, uh, uh, they are considered as hypothetical necessities. So in, uh, in the sphere of reality, he in fact have this, has these two necessities, one hypothetical and one absolute. Absolute, mm implies existence in sense of E. Uh, so, uh, and moreover, also again, he explicitly says that possibility and uh, necessity also cannot be defined. But uh, mm. of course he claims that definition, this good definition is Aristotelian definition. <laughs> so uh, 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 this should be considered in this context of, of this, sort of definitions. Concerning okay. comparing, uh, uh, concerning this, uh, 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 to compare the content or, or the meaning of these two predicates, E and W, this wirklich, yes, and existence, I am sure that they are in fact different. However, in this proof, there is, in both of this proof, uh, uh, there it is not clear. When mm. you read the beginning of Bolzano text, there is something virtually, he says, I know it at least by this, that now I have this idea, he says. So uh, uh, he refers to something which is not in space and time, I would say, to something ideal. And uh, the same is concerning this E predicate or existence predicate by Avicenna. Also, he says that impression of of existence it comes from the soul <laughs> so mm -hmm. so uh, uh, th probably there is a big big area of of investigations but mm -hmm. there are similarities maybe in the wider context you could see more differences i don't know if yeah. i uh, explain everything what is new no, that's some very clear idea, idea idea lists maybe <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just kidding. But uh, maybe. <laughs> just one quick follow up is I'm wondering is the word contingent, would that be better than possible? Because I mean, in ordinary modal logic, for example, necessity implies possibility, but, but they're contrasted. Yes, but this, is, but this is not this case. This is not this case. But, uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately, by contingent people, uh, I mean, according to philosophical dictionary, let's say some folklore, people say that contingent are these things which exist, but they could not be existent. And here, possibility. Right. Possibility is uh, 
some, I mean, uh, is a wider, uh, 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 wider um, uh, uh, yeah. notion, but it does not uh, go with necessity as in a normal model logics. It is not mm. this. There are actually, there are a, a few places where contingency is just when, uh, uh, when, uh, for example, uh, uh, Edward Zalta's work, uh, he's a, a possibilist, so he includes both uh, uh, existing and or actual and non-actual things. And he defines contingency just simply means uh, to mean possibly existent. And so that does encompass, that doesn't imply actuality. Right, yes, 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 but, but Professor Zalta has this zoo of inconsistent objects, yes, because he, yeah, but this, yes, but but that this part is another of, thing, yes, yes. That part is independent of his theory yes, of abstract yes. objects, yes. though. He's, and just in, for a possibilist generally, if you, if you just have actual things and merely possible things, you could define contingent just to mean possibly uh, actual, and yes. that, would in, that would not imply existence. All right, I've, I've said enough. More thank than you. Thank, thank you very much for, for the answer and thank you very much, Professor Menzel, for developing this thank very you. important issue. Uh, now we have two questions from uh, Professor Shretsko Kovac and Professor Alexey Murawicki. So, Professor Kovac, please, the floor is thank yours. You. Thank you. If, uh, if you can hear me. So, yes, just, yes. Uh, uh -huh. just, just one small remark or, or question. So, uh, there was on, on one slide. A comparison between two ex, uh, two series of axioms, and so uh, I, I think uh, uh, in one line there we had on the left an axiom with the predicate condition, and on the right side there was the predicate possible. So as if uh, mm, as if we have uh, in one case causality, co uh, conditionedness causality and and, uh, and in the other case uh, modality so just one uh, small question or 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 uh, or a remark uh, uh, does this difference between Avicenna's approach and Bolzano's approach has something to do with this distinction between causality and modality or there is and certainly there, there is something more uh, 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 to this although both are using as uh, causality as well as modality but but maybe uh, in a different roles uh, thank so. you very much for the question and i am very ha happy to see you Sretko. so hello <laughs> me too <laughs> thank you uh, so uh, uh, when it comes to this comparison between uh Uncon no between conditioned and uh, and uh, possible in sense of uh, of um, uh, Avicenna, I should uh, uh, follow consequently this uh, uh, line which I started already uh, uh, concerning questions and answer Professor Mansell, and I would say that uh, uh, to be possible uh, and actual it means to be conditioned. And co so uh, uh, if something is conditioned, it is already real. But uh, possible can be that it is not real. But when you add the existence, then it is the same as conditioned. In which system? Bo uh, Bolzano's? Uh, yes, in Bolzano's system. And, and in Avicenna's case? Uh, when you will take uh, un, uh, to be conditioned from Bolzano, you can put it in, uh, in Avicenna's story, but probably you should consider it as to be existent and possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in Bolzano, you don't have, at least in this text, you don't have such a modality as to be possible only as to be conditioned and unconditioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, thanks. Thank sorry. you. Thank you very much. And now we have a question from uh, Professor Alexey Muravitsky. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, models uh, for uh, 
formal theories. And I'm wondering if um, the uh, formal theories you define are categorical in uh, uh, model theory sense, because if they are not, then, uh, well, what you prove for G that there is God, God can be many things. If your theory, formal theories, either of them is not categorical. How would you interpret uh, this? So in the, I mean, these theories, uh, I mean, at least in this frame, I mean, these fragments, which we took for these models, yes, of yes. course they are not categorical, but independently, if they are categorical or not categorical, you are not forced to take in the model uh, some special objects which you would like to have. Even if the theory is categorical, you only know that you have isomorphic uh, uh, models, yes, but you can put in these models uh, a god or, or computers or, or shoes. And uh, it is, I mean, it is such a thing, yes, model theory, of course, you can put in the semantics, uh, I mean, in comments, what which model you would like to create. But another thing is to express all these things in a subject language. So in fact, models from our, our uh, point of view are mainly to show at first that these theories are consistent. This is the first. Mm -hmm. Somebody would say, well, yeah. it's nothing special. But for me, it is a special thing to have consistent theory. And the other thing is really to control how far you can jump out uh, from intuitions, yes? And this, in fact, these two simple theories, because they are rather simple concerning this formal uh, uh, stuff. Simply, they don't say anything, I mean, really not many informations. Now, no. I think it is the, the point to put them in a richer context, in a bigger theory of a uh, 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 formal theory, which could be considered as some kind of formalization of a bigger part of metaphysics of Avicenna or of Bolzano. It is only some small, small, let's say, uh, 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 ma ma machine. <laughs> yes, only, only to show that, okay, this fragment works, but you, we uh, cannot uh, expect anything special from these models. Do you think that uh, categoricity uh, is not important for uh, ontological argument at all? No, I mean, of course, it, it is nice to have this categoricity, but still it is not enough. Mm -hmm. But, but it is still be, not, 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 be, not enough. It would be nice to have categorical uh, theory uh, about ontological argument, which would be uh, a, an additional uh, force to, to claim that God is unique. Uh, here, I mean, for, for example, in this theory, uh, in both these theories, there, there is no guarantee that you have one God, for example, yes? Uh, so this special element can be, I mean, there can be many. Uh, what is the difference between these two, for example, is that when you have anything which is a cause of anything other, yes? Uh, and this thing is, uh, let's say, some aggregate, then this thing is a uh, cause of all its parts. And this is not said in Bolzano's story. So when you get this God in Avicenna, you have also the picture that he must be the cause of all these objects which are in the starting set, for example. And this you don't have in Bolzano. But still, concerning the nature of these individuals, which you consider also this uh, contingent individuals or this one or many uncontingent, simply it is far too much. Uh, uh, I mean, we expect from the syntax far too much what is in, in semantics. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a remark, uh, if I may. Uh, to uh, Christopher uh, Menzel's uh, comment uh, about that necessity implies uh, possibility. Well, this is not model logic uh, because uh, necessity and possibility 
uh, used uh, in the first stock at least uh, are not logical constants. They are predicates. So it, it, it's, it's not that necessity implies possibility because it's not model logic. They're, I'm, I'm, they're I'm not just referring to. They're I'm not. Just referring to they're not modalities. They're predicates. Sure. If if you take them to me, if you use uh, is necessary uh, and is possible, then you have predicates. If you use the adverbs necessarily and possibly, uh, I'm just talking about standard modal logic in standard. No, in standard, uh, standard apply, classical modal logic. Yeah, in it's, standard it's, logic, you apply. Uh, logical constants that's necessity and possibility to propositions. Here you apply predicates mm -hmm. to terms. That's sure. the difference. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. That there is a there is a difference that could be spelled out there for sure. Uh, okay, are there any other questions? If not, I have one, but first I wanted to hear if you. Uh, if, if not, for now, um, I have another question to, to Professor Świętorzecka concerning what you have mentioned. I mean, some weak points of, um, of the arguments. Uh, can you indicate other weak points? I mean, I would like to hear about your criticism to these uh, arguments. I have here five ways, uh, ways of Bohensky and this uh, also Avicennian proof, yeah? Uh, so he, of course, says that the third way um, is not working logically speaking, and uh, in it's unacceptable, unacceptable in fact. Uh, what do you think about these two, two arguments? Uh, what are the weak points? Uh, what are the problems with them? Or maybe they just work? <laughs> I mean, I am very impressed by both of them. There is one thing maybe which I didn't mention enough or maybe even at all, but maybe this is interesting for philosophers. Uh, Bolzano, um, as you know, he was a Catholic priest and he was also taught of the philosophy of St. Thomas. And in a particular, he of course knew these arguments for existence of God uh, for, for, uh, formed by St. Thomas. And he explicitly wrote that he is against this idea uh, that this regress as at infinitum is, uh, uh, is impossible. Uh, uh, we know that uh, Bolzano was a mathematician and for him uh, the infinite in context of his known book Paradoxes of the Infinite, simply it was quite natural notion. And even in this text, it is written that, well, you can form this big set of this, uh, this uh, objects which are conditioned and real and you can do it even if it is uh, it, it is infinite and you can form some aggregate which will be real and even when it is infinite you can do it and uh, for me it was interesting let's say intellectual construction that finally we are free of this uh, very strong uh, um, uh, axiom given by, uh, by, by, by St. Thomas and also many other people yes that you cannot proceed at infinitum, why? Because you wouldn't find a, a God, so you cannot. <laughs> yes, there is some, some uh, 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 difficult thing that you see that there is some circle in it. And so I was very impressed by Bolzano who, explic who explicitly rejected this, uh, uh, this assumption. And he had this, uh, uh, really, he, he got this effect. Of course, there are other costs. Yes, uh, uh, all these uh, arguments, they are uh, uh, full of, co of philosophical content and decisions. But, uh, but this uh, I liked very much in Bolzano. And this is somehow repeated, but in a slightly weaker version in Avicenna. Avicenna followed uh, uh, in many places uh, uh, Aristotle. And he also uh, said that you cannot uh, uh, go at infinitum, I mean, if uh, uh, concerning the chain of causes. But in this uh, argument, he said, okay, even if somebody would accept it, I will show you that you will get a, 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 a God out even from this 
assumption. If it is infinite or infinite uh, or finite, you you can have it. So uh, uh, I mean, this is this idea is very nice. Also, I think that from historical point of view, these two argumentations are uh, uh, interesting in context of this. Um, uh, how does it call this uh, argument against uh, um, uh, infinite time of the world? Uh, how does it call this argument? Uh, I will tell you. There was some uh, some argument which was in Islam theology, which uh, was defended the uh, theorem about this um, for, form of the word as uh, 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 let's say topum ex nihilo, kalam argument, kalam argument, and this they come from this kalam argumentation. They have something similar, so also it is interesting. So I am great fan of this tool, <laughs> but mm -hmm. concerning weaknesses, I think that they have so many weaknesses as other uh, as other formalizations of this type. So but I like them. <laughs> okay, I like them too. <laughs> uh, thank you also for uh, showing these historical links. I also wonder about some uh, Bonaventurian uh, versions of Avicennian uh, arguments, but this is another story, I think, too long. And we have uh, another question from uh, Professor Simon Babs. Uh, please ask the question, the floor is yours. Simon Babs, yeah. Uh, we cannot hear you. Please uh, turn the microphone. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it, okay. <laughs> it may be that I misunderstood um, the, the, the presentation, but I think I heard that one of the thinkers um, was considering the aggregate of things which were conditioned, i.e. things which were caused by something else. And the other thinker was thinking in terms of an aggregate of things which were it themselves causes. I, th I think the latter was Avicenna. And that if you if everything, if everything in the aggregate is a cause of something, aren't you either going to have loops or an infinite collection? I'd be grateful if you'd comment on that issue and also whether the distinction between um caused things and things which are causes um plays a significant is a significant difference between the arguments maybe i will answer for uh, concerning the second question because i am not sure if i perfectly understood your first question maybe there was some problem with connection but come uh, uh, if uh, if i would come to the second one what is the difference uh, uh, between to be cause or to be cost <laughs> is by some cause uh, uh, god is a cause of of other things but he is not uh, uh, caused by anything no, no I, I i understand the difference between being a cause and being caused what uh -huh. i the difference i was attempting to articulate was that in one thinker the aggregate of um things possible in themselves i thought you said were thing the the aggregate of things which themselves had causes and in the other so, thinker it was the aggregate of things which caused other things uh, i am sorry in con on the concerning avicenna i considered the set of real possible and causes of something in case of bolzano we are considered the set of real and caused by something nothing more in the avicenna case then would that not mean that you would have either causal loops or an infinite chain of causing things because if everything in the aggregate causes something then the aggregate must go on and on I mean, it can it can happen. Of course, it depends on conditions which you will put on causality. Yes, uh, uh, if of course it can. For example, we could think about transitivity of cause relation. Yes, we could think. Okay, when I, for example, we have uh, uh, we have um, 
irreflect irreflexivity yes but uh, for example it is not uh, uh, not transitive then you could have loops you could have loops of course <laughs> then, the, but it is not decided here how it uh, how it looks like uh, uh, in both cases and that might be a problem or not I mean, it is open field, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, one can work with it, and one, one should uh, simply uh, read the papers of Avicenna, especially, and to find it what, what he has in his mind. But what surely it is the point that he has this irreflexivity. And this is enough to have, I mean, concerning this argument. I don't know if I answer Professor Babs. Th thanks. <laughs> thank okay, you. Okay, and, and thank you very much. And we have another question from Professor Jerry Chandler. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, very interesting uh, talks, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this series. Uh, my question is more from a his the historical perspective of the development of uh, logics, and particularly categorical logics. And within this framework, I'm concerned particularly with the Aristotelian notion of material causality, which is by and large excluded by some philosophers uh, in favor of the uh, um, dominance or, uh, hmm, can't think of the word. Uh, anyway, the, the dominance of efficient causality and completely ignoring anticipatory uh, causality associated with um, particularly biological systems or formal, formal and theological causalities. So the issue then is more to the issue of the relationship historically of the influence of the inverse square laws of physics, uh, those of Newton and of Coulomb. Now, uh, the difficult, the conundrum here, the deep conundrum, which seems to be ignored by almost most philosophers and logicians both, uh, is the issue of the conflict between the use of symbols in Newton's law, which has exactly the same form uh, as the Coulomb's law. The difference being is that with Coulomb's law, you have a system where the symbols may generate attractors and repellers. So with that as background, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, atomic theory, uh, the elemental notions of four, uh, uh, four forms of, of elements, that is air, water, earth, and, and uh, 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 fire, uh, were brought uh, together and uh, replaced by atomic theory. Now, in, in this notion of atomic theory, uh, they use the, the table of elements as the grounding for the logic of the parts of the whole. And within this parts of the whole, they uh, used Coulomb's law basically to establish attractors and repellers that is causes and effects within the quantum theory and its consequences. Now, now I come to, with that, all that is background information and painting a, a scene or a scenario for the situations. Uh, one now turns to the table of chemical elements. And this is a series of numbers. It is a series of numbers which are arranged in order and quantified. And each of these has a particular meaning. That is, it has an identity independent of its position in the series. And so when you come to the Kantian notions involved, uh, I, I find difficulty uh, relating to the causal arguments as were presented by the latter two speakers. And it, it's within this context, I'd ask them to, how do they clarify and put into context the arithmetic series or the numerical series of the atomic numbers 
and the causality associated with those in particularly in life forms uh, with their notions of Kantian uh, philosophy or uh, it, uh, their notions of logic of causality in, in the context of Aristotelian material causality. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, I am not a specialist to, co to comment and to, uh, to take uh, the attempt to, to go in discussion with Professor Chandler. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, uh, this oh, but my uh, question was addressed to the latter two speakers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I am okay. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, I had some problems with internet. Could you please very briefly uh, recapitulate your main point? Uh, well, the, the, the bottom, the final termination mm -hmm. of the sequence of arguments was that the atomic numbers form a series. And this series is, of atomic numbers is not directly related to a time series and hence causality within time. And so the chemical and thermodynamic community use a different notion of material causality when they use a time series. They use in other words, classical space-time sort of notions as opposed to causality as a series of different chemical elements. Yeah, so in, uh, in this part presented by, by Bazos, uh, we try to exactly present another, another notion of causality. So we refer to uh, to the one we can, for example, find in physics. So our this this what we call intuitive notion of, of causality it was a kind of starting point, uh, but we didn't try to uh, restrain ourselves only to to this point. So of course, yeah, thank you, thank you for this this further examples. Uh, we just uh, yeah used the, the one we can we can take from physics, where we see that this very intuitive idea of of a cause as something timely temporally preceding its effect it's very easily falsified uh we have yeah the various forces in physics even in in newtonian physics right uh forces which enter they they cause some effects but they do not necessarily precede these effects uh so yeah Thank you. Thank you. That, that uh, does not get to the essence of my argument, which was the, initially the conflict between the use of symbolic logic for both New Newton's laws and Coulomb's law. That, that's the essence of my concern, is this conflict between these two physical laws of forces and the uh, dichotomy of the consequences of using uh, a, a system which only has attractive forces in Newtonian law versus Coulomb's law, which has both attractive and repulsive forces, and hence it's creation a different notion of motion. Mm. Yeah, to be to be to be honest, I, I don't have a very brief answer to this question. I would I would need to think about it a bit more, uh, a bit longer, but. Uh... Yeah, it's it's certainly worth to, to think about these two types of forces in Newton, yeah, Newtonian and and Coulomb's forces. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I would be very, you know, I would really love to hear how you come to some resolution of this deep conundrum for for me. But one aspect which, as I've thought about this issue, has become the difference between the intuitionist logic with double negation and the chemical logic which requires a double <laughs> affirmation and and this is a really profound conflict in my own thinking it may not be so profound for others but uh it, it is uh, deeply related to the relationship between living organisms and uh, in, in, you know uh, just raw materialism Newtonian, or I should say, yeah, Newtonian materialism. Okay, thank you for this remark. I think it will be a great inspiration for both authors. Uh, or maybe you want to somehow react or 
because if not, I have the last question, the final question, because we, we have to finish uh, today's webinar. Uh, uh, the question is about time. Uh, I mean, mm, isn't, is it a, a problem with, uh, uh, with, in fact, the time loops? Or maybe with Kant, <laughs> and to be serious, uh, you took from Gödel the, the conclusion that if we assume that mm, the time loops are possible, uh, the time shouldn't exist, uh, th does not exist, yeah? Uh, and then you compared it with uh, Kantian uh, notion of time, but is it the same? Yeah, the notion of time taken uh, taken by Gödel, Gödel, um, uh, from Einstein, yeah, and the notion of time of time taken taken from the critic of pure reason, uh, because perhaps we have two two different concepts or approaches, like in Augustine, yeah, the objective and subjective, but maybe here we have something more um, sophisticated. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, and this this will be, I think, the the last question. Uh, maybe I could try to answer that. Uh, so there is also one very interesting text of, of Gödel's. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's called Some Observations uh, about uh, Kantian philosophy of, and special relativity, when he actually sees a very deep um, co coincidence in Kantian notion of time of, as a subjective form of experience and the relative time of, of relativity of, of Einstein. So um, anyway, it would be uh, because in, in Gödel's argument, he develops this argument against a more objective notion. So, but it's not objective in a sense that it's absolute. Uh, it's still uh, more formal, elaborate uh, understanding of time in, in general relativity that in principle in, in, in this model of the universe, of rotating universe, um, we could not be able to construct a general time that would uh, in general enable us to, to uh, even compare this other relative uh, times of different observers. Uh, and the, the key thing is with time loops that, uh, because generally we can think about in special relativity that time of one observer can stretch and uh it, it, relatively to, to to another one so for me the the time between two events can be i don't know one minute and uh for for some someone else one hour let's say uh so it's more about the problem of of scale of this time but the real problem with rotating universe is that with uh if we allow this time loops, the causality and the, the direction of time can switch. And then it becomes inconsistent in, in Gödel's view. So, okay, yeah. so I assume, uh, you assume that they are more le or less uh, talking about the same. Yeah, I mean, Einstein, Gödel and, uh, Gödel and, uh, and Kant, in, in fact, we can compare. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we have this assumption. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. For, thank you for staying with us. Uh, I'd like to ask you to, to stay three or five minutes longer because um, Francisco de Asis Mariano uh, from Logic and Religion Association has, has an announcement for us related to the next webinar and perhaps uh, the Logic and Religion, the Congress on Logic and Religion in Varanasi, maybe. Uh, and me personally, I would like to thank you very, very much for being with us, uh, especially I would like to thank uh, Professor Kordula Świętorzecka for accepting the, the invitation and for giving us a brilliant talk. Uh, and to our uh, speakers, um, Michał Pawłowski and Bartosz Wesu for also an impelling talk. Um, thank you again uh, and
Let's see what else is Mariano will, will give us this announcement. As is, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again and goodbye. Thanks again, everyone, for staying with us. Um, I would like to uh, also thank you, our speakers, for the great job they have done today. Um, and meanwhile, I also want to announce our next webinar, which will take place um, next month. It will be um, on July 7. The talk will be um, will be the importance of informal intuition to the logic end of religion. And this talk will be given by Professor Andrew Pinson from Oxford University. He's a, um, a Catholic priest and he works on very uh, many fields um, in the philosophy of religion and more, most importantly in the relationship between um, science and religion. So I will be waiting for you next, next month. So I hope to see you, all of you again. Thank you.